Welcome to Tuesday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Giants. We are here on Giants.com every weekday from 12.30 p.m. for one hour to talk Giants football and all things NFL. Thanks for being with us. I'm Paul Dottino. He is Super Bowl champion Howard Cross. And we're going to get right into it in just a moment, but put this number away for later on in the show. 201-939-4513. 201-939-4513 if you'd like to give us a call. But in the first half of the program, we're going to talk about Alabama's NFL draft prospects. Yeah. Roll Tide, right, Howard? Roll Tide. Yeah, okay. I, I, I've i been around this guy long enough to know. <laughs> and then we're going to quickly go down to Orlando, Florida, and the NFL League meetings and get a quick recap on what's going on from Mike Eisen, senior writer of uh, Giants.com. But first up, let's give you a reminder. You can always find uh, this entire archive of, of this show and our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and at Giants.com slash podcast. Now it's time to bring in our first guest of the day. And the Alabama Crimson Tide annually have a plethora of players who go into the NFL draft and mm-hmm. get taken very, very high. <laughs> Ryan Fowler is a host of the Tide 100.9 FM down in Tuscaloosa. Long time of familiarity with Howard Cross. As uh, Ryan, we were talking just before the show, I said, Howard, you know Ryan? He goes, everybody knows Ryan down there. <laughs> so thanks for joining us today. Well, everybody tries to. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I love this place, man. I, I've... Um... Listen, to, to be a guy that grew up in North Alabama, I mean, mm-hmm. the sticks of Alabama, to grew, come to Tuscaloosa, uh, I think a lot of people call me the voice of Tuscaloosa, which is fine. Uh, I love this place. I mean, this is my home. I've been here, you know, like many people can come to the university and you stay, and now I'm doing a radio show, and I've covered Mike DeBose, Coach Fran, Mike Price, Mike Shula, Nick Saban, and now Kaylin DeBoer. So it's a lot of fun, man. Sometimes I have to pinch myself to make sure I'm doing – uh, this job that I dreamed of doing as a, as, as a child. That's awesome. Well, let me ask you the first question to kick this thing off, because I think it's, it's probably a pretty good debate, and I'd like to know where you stand on it. Uh, J.C. Latham and Dallas Turner, who is going to be the first Alabama player off the board in the draft and why? I think it's probably going to be Dallas Turner, just because of the measurables. When, when you look at Dallas Turner, I mean, we knew that he was going to test very, very well. And he gives you everything, especially with what Will Anderson was able to do, you know, in the NFL last year. I know they're two different players. I get that. But it, it, it's looking at this Alabama way of doing things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, once Dallas got to the NFL combine, that, that the, you know, the measure was, were going to be there. And uh, this guy just, he's a lunch pail, work boot uh, type mentality. I mean, that, that's what he brings to a locker room. And I think with the success of Will Anderson, that may help him a little bit. I mean, he was his running mate. And, you know, at times, I mean, they each got different techniques. But, Mm -hmm. um, you know, Dallas is a guy that just really puts a lot of pressure and really, you know, allowed Chris uh, Chris Brasbell to grow up as well. I mean, Dallas Turner uh, created some extra attention himself and really allowed Chris Brasbell to have the season that he had. Yeah, Chris did a a great year. I was thinking that Chris might be, you know, challenging uh, Turner for, for that first pick from Alabama. Yeah, it's another guy. And, and, I mean, you know, it's all like, you know, when you get to the NFL draft, you're looking through these guys, you're going, okay, uh, you know, you, you could even create competition with Terry and Arnold or Kool-Aid McKinnistry, you know, which DB goes first there. Mm-hmm. Uh, both of those guys have certainly earned their title. But, you know, you look back at J.C. Latham, at times I know that an offensive line is a unit. Mm-hmm. But I didn't think that this offensive line did a great job as a unit. Now, when you look at J.C. Latham individualized and just put look look at him as a player, yeah, he checks all the boxes of an NFL tackle. Yeah, I mean, he, he does. I mean, he's he's also lost a little bit of weight, too, because when I saw him at the Pro Day last Wednesday, mm-hmm. uh looked like he was probably down a good 15 to 20 pounds. He just looked quicker, looked you know, going through all those different agilities. So that may be more of a comfortable weight for him. But, but this sack, I mean, I don't have to explain to Howard anything. I mean, this sack number that Alabama gave up, they were 129 out of 133 teams at keeping the quarterback upright. I mean, they were not a good football team, you know, in protecting the quarterback. So, uh, as a whole, this team unit struggled. But when you isolate it and look at J.C. Latham, he had a really good season. Yeah, that, but that that was, you know, you know, a bunch of factors happening. That, that's some of the, some of the scheme that was some of the – 
errant snaps that were going all over the place. So it, it, it didn't help a lot when you weren't sure the ball was coming some of the time with his quarterback. But I, but I definitely understand. But he he's a you know measurables yes feet great uh, big strong guy. He, he's a road grader in the run. The pass protection is where you know where they're going to try to figure out if he's good enough to be that you know in top ten pick. Yeah. Well, and, and and I think, you know, top 10 to me might be stretching it to me. I, I think it's Dallas Turner. I, I just think mm-hmm. Dallas Turner is going to be one of those first guys off the board. Okay. And then y- you might see uh, some maybe those teens kind of pick up J.C. Latham. And, you know, Howard, do you think he could play left in, in the NFL or do you think he's right all day long? I think, I think he could do two things. I think he could play play a right tackle, which would be great for a lot of teams. A lot of teams are looking for right tackles because every every player that comes out of college swears up and down he's a left tackle, only a left tackle. And I think he could slide into guard probably and play, which is which is you know a double dual thing that can make him more valuable to a team. You need that Swiss Army knife of a lineman when you get guys out there, and he has the feet and he could pull and get down the line of scrimmage. Like I say, he's losing some weight. He realizes what he needs to do to, to get to the next level. So. Yeah, I think he he could play. You know, uh, if had to, left tackle, but definitely right tackle and inside inside of one of those guards. Uh, he he no doubt is a, a lot of fun to cover. He's a you know good guy in the locker room, is my understanding. He's kind of a leadership guy, and they they got several of these guys. I'm sure you're asking about, but uh, J.C. Latham was kind of a core leader because remember this this Alabama season didn't really get off to a start uh, that they needed. Uh, got off to a, kind of a bumpy start, and that leadership kind of rallied the troops and allow this team to be a playoff team, which is maybe something we were not thinking back in September. Let me go back to Turner and Braswell, if I can, for a second, Ryan, because, you know, when I was out at the Combine a couple of months, well, a month or so ago, it seems like forever ago, um, the the common thought there is that, you know, you usually see these high-profile edge rushers go very, very high in that top ten. Mm-hmm. But this year, with the three quarterbacks who everybody thinks are going to go first. Potentially four. A couple, yeah, maybe four. Mm-hmm. Uh, offensive line. Yeah, there's a couple tackles that everybody thinks are going to go high. Receivers. Three wide receivers mm-hmm. everybody thinks is going to go high. It's a real weird circumstance that there's a chance, I mean, depending upon where Latu of UCLA goes, mm-hmm. you might not have an edge rusher go in the top ten. You just said yourself you're not sure if Turner's a top ten guy. So – in another draft, would Turner and Braswell be getting a lot more attention than they are? Is this simply a matter of circumstance that the other positions have more quantity of high-profile guys? Or are these guys maybe just not as good as some of those other great prospects we've seen? I think it's what you said first. I, I think it's just draft, and it's it, it's kind of funny how need is there. And if need's at the top and you've got a team that has that need, uh, go get it. And, and if you believe that he's high enough on your draft board. So, yeah, I think if you look at a, a typical year, I mean, we could probably go back to, you know, Dallas Turner last year or Dallas Turner the year prior. Uh, it, it seems like, yeah, they would be a little bit more value, but probably to drop off a player, I don't think there's going to be a lot of difference in what Will Anderson was able to do in Dallas Turner. I mean, the, yeah, they're two different players. I get that. But, I mean, as far as production, I watched both of them, you know, here in Tuscaloosa. And, you know, if you have switched out jerseys, yeah, I mean, you could have been able to say, hey, that's Will Anderson, that's Dallas Turner. Mm-hmm. But they play so similar uh, together. I mean, it, the pressure that they're able to do, and, you know, maybe you know someone else can break it down from more of a fundamental standpoint, but when your eye test, just a generic eye test, when you look out there, uh, they, they both have very similar tendencies. And, and even Chris Braswell, who kind of grew up into that next spot. I mean, mm-hmm. he was kind of the guy that would have played a ton. I mean, I kept having some of the coaches would tell me, uh, the assistant coaches would say, you know, th- this Chris Braswell guy is just as good as Dallas Turner and Will Anderson. The only problem is he, he didn't have a ring to play. I mean, unless there was an injury, there was there was nowhere to play. And so he got a limited time to kind of show you what he could do. Uh, I think Chris Braswell is going to be another big-time player in the National Football League. I just think he checks a lot of those boxes, too. Yeah, the, the difference between Turner and Anderson is that, you know, Turner's got a little bit longer arms, I think. You know, he's kind of lengthy. He plays with a lot more bend when he gets to the edge on guys. He can, you know, one-arm you and push you back, but he plays with a lot more bend. Will's just like a, a force of nature, so to speak. He can overpower you. He comes inside. He comes outside. Not not known for the big bend when he gets to the edge to, to you know, turn off that corner, but that's kind of what the big difference is between the two guys and, and the explosion. You know, the Turner showed it in the uh, combine is it, you know, kind of like very validated what it was going on. Brazen, kind of the same guy. You're, you're right. They're, they're playing kind of the same position. They kind of do same measurables. But, you know, the guy who gets the 
I guess the, the first call or the marquee name, it gets more attention. Yeah. Well, and, and, and also keep in mind now, Alabama, I wasn't a big fan of their outside linebacker coach here. Mm-hmm. So they may get better coaching uh, at that outside linebacker spot. Uh, Coleman Hutzler was here, and uh, uh, people tell me that you know he taught some bad habits to Will that somebody had to clean up for the NFL Combine prior to Will going out. <laughs> okay. um, I, I, I will say that I think he'll have better coaching because I think Coleman Hutzler was the weak link on this coaching staff, and unfortunately he was the outside linebackers coach at Alabama. And I, I say, you know, I know people say, well, hold on, Nick Saban didn't hire a bad guy. Uh, Nick Saban, at the back end of his tenure, the quality coaches were just not where they needed to be. And when you look at Coleman Huntsford, he's at Mississippi State. I believe he's a defense coordinator over there now. Mm-hmm. But outside linebacker just, to me, did not get the production that maybe we thought with that type of superstar, you know, mentality. Uh, just really, you know, they, they, they got some sacks, but I thought maybe they should have had a little bit more. And uh, as I hear more about Coleman Hutzler, I, I kind of think that maybe better coaching in the NFL is coming. Let's talk about three other prospects, and I want you to separate them just a little bit here because Arnold and McKinstry are your two defensive backs who a lot of people are going to be high on, and the Giants could use another corner. They could also (laughs) use another receiver. I don't know that Jermaine Burton necessarily fits what they want to do, but but these are three guys who are certainly going to get a lot of attention. All right, so let's start with Terry and Arnold. And, you know, I think we all know about Kuhn and McKinstry, but I'm Mm -hmm. going to walk through both of these guys. But... Terry Arnold, this is the type of player uh, that he is. Okay, let, let's go back, not 2023, but 2022. He was really struggling, and but he had earned the position. He went to Coach Saban and said, hey, Eli Ricks is better. Play him. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I need to get better. I need to get better. So he literally hmm. said, for the, for the betterment of the team, let's put Eli Ricks in. And if you remember in 2022, he did. He was a difference maker when mm-hmm. you talk about there. I mean, and, and look at Terry Arnold. He took that moment in time and said, I've got to get better. I've got to get better. We did. And now this guy is a projected first rounder when you look at Terry Arnold. To me, that's a story that is not told enough. And it's also a told of, of a locker room, uh, team first attitude, you know, that I would want to build a locker room around. Uh, that's the type of personality. Every time I ever met Terry Arnold, uh, in a media availability, like I walk away energized because his energy is just contagious. I mean, that's who he is. Kool-Aid, an- another guy that you know brings a lot of energy, but Kool-Aid really didn't have a lot of struggles other than some of the punt return, right? I mean, the punt return just it really never could get off for Alabama. They mm-hmm. finally you know, ended up having to go another direction. But when you look at two lockdown corners, uh, that's a luxury that most defensive coordinators in the college football <laughs> ranks. If you can have two of those on the same field. Right, I mean, NFL probably... coaches don't get that very often either. No, not at all. <laughs> well, it, hey, when, when you talk about locking them down and saying, hey, we can bring a lot of other things, uh, Terry Arnold and, and Kool-Aid McKinnistry, that's all you need to say okay. is they trusted them to say, hey, you lock your, this guy down, you lock this guy down. We get Dallas Turner and Chris Braswell coming off the edge. Uh, hopefully we can win most of those competitions. And, and, and they did win quite a few. I mean, uh, the defense definitely made improvements uh, in year number one under Kevin Steele. Yep, absolutely. And Burton at wide receiver. All right, so here's the thing. Okay, Burton is, is a guy that's going to play uh, with his emotions on his, you know, on his shoulder pads. He's a guy that's probably going to tell you a few things. He's probably going to uh, – I talk with this young man out in uh, L.A., out at the Rose Bowl, and we don't ever get a chance to interview him because he's a guy that sometimes will say things that, that you know, they don't want out. Uh, and so <laughs> <Okay>. – Well, <laughs> Well, because he doesn't, he doesn't really have a filter, right? I mean, it, the filter's just not there. Okay. It's stopped up or something. But after sitting there talking with him, I almost became a bigger fan because he told me the pressure that's on him to play and to achieve his dream. And he told me that, you know, that he wants to go and to be able to make some money, to be able to take care of his sister Mm -hmm. and his mom. And he said, how much they've supported me. I want to be able to give back. So I place a lot of my pressure on me. So that's why I play with a different energy, knowing that if, if I don't make it, they don't make it. Hmm. And they're not going to be able to ha- – and I was just sitting there going – I mean, I literally – yeah, hey, man. I mean, listen, we're, we're in the media business, but 
every now and then that, that you know that onion around my eyes or something kind of gets some mm-hmm. water in a little bit. I mean, I'm just sitting here listening to this young man's story, and I'm just like, man. I mean, it, I, now I became a Germ- Jermaine Burton, and sometimes you don't hear those personal stories. So he's a guy that can give you a lot of things as a wide receiver. But really, the, the thing that jumps out to me is he's not afraid to go across the middle. Physical, 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 physical. But now the trade-off is you're going to have a little smack talk. You're, you're going to have a guy that's going to jump up, jump in somebody's grill, and uh, he's probably going to do some things that you have to, you know, like, I mean, I'm looking over Alabama beat Georgia in the SEC title game, uh, and, and I guess Georgia fans have been trolling him, like, on, on social networks. He goes to the student section, okay? And he's over there doing all these hand signs. He's spelling out Crimson Tide. I mean, it's like, like by himself. And I'm like, what is what is what is Burton doing? He's over there trolling the Georgia fans. That's funny. So I'm, but it, in 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 a way that is funny. Like he's laughing. It's not mean spirited. It's just no. he's having fun. So that that's just who he is. I, he's going to wear his personality, you know, on his shoulder pads. But the more he played the more I liked him. But will I tell you that uh, he's a guy that needs to grow as a player and as a person? No, I mean, I think that's obvious. But you could start to see the little bit of flash in his skill set. And I almost wonder, when I look back and I think about this year, if that offense would have been cranked up a little bit more. We were not a team that threw the football a a ton. Like, we, we did when we needed to, but not consistent enough. And I think that was pretty frustrating a little bit for Jermaine Burton because you could read the nonverbals, right? You could read him, you know, kicking the ball or throwing the ball because our offense really just didn't get to where it needed to be. I think somebody, if you can get Jermaine Burton, and I don't even know where he's projected, but, you know, maybe a mid-round, get him in, let him bind the system. I think you could guide him to really being a productive player in the NFL. I think he's got the speed. He's got the hands. It's just those little bitty things. Put him with an offense that can feature his skill set, and I think he can really put up some good numbers. I, like I said, I haven't seen exactly where he has been projected to go, uh, but I would just guessing. I'd probably say what third, fourth round, and maybe a little bit high on that. It, it, well, it's a lot of receivers. I couldn't project where he's going to go, but I, I tell you one thing: if okay. he if he if he really wants to play, and he's really you know given the story that if he makes it, his, his family makes it, he'll fit in anywhere. Like that that's his responsibility as as a young man or as a man himself. He he has to, you know, get it done. And and like what there are so many opportunities that he will. He could be covering some some punts. He he can he'll do if he can do if he's willing to do anything, then he'll make it. That's what that's what it kinda takes when you're coming in there. And if you're not, you know, the first ten picks or the first whatever, you gotta be willing to do anything to play. And if you're willing to do anything, you usually make it for a long time. Well, you know, Ryan, he had to help himself at the combine because his athletic scores were all very good, including yeah. the four four five. The, the, the that's le- not going to hurt. And an eleven foot yeah. broad jump too yeah, didn't, hurt, exactly. didn't hurt him at all either. So yeah, he's explosive. Well, that, that's for sure. Well, he, he's an athlete. I mean, he and, and really he's a you know kind of a gutsy player because you don't see him tiptoeing across that middle. I mean, he, he's a guy that'll go across there. He's not. You know, afraid to catch it. Matter of fact, he, he'll he'll kind of deliver some lumber too as he's getting hit. I mean, he, he's. I mean, sometimes the defensive guys. I've seen their reaction like, "Whoa, this guy's physical." I mean, he's a physical wide receiver. If you look at him at the line of scrimmage, trying to get off those defensive jams, uh, he's just he gives you a lot. Now he loves that deep ball. Now that's that's his speed. He likes to open it up a little bit, and you know, at times we hit the deep ball, and at times we didn't. But uh, Jermaine Burton. Uh, definitely, and think about where he was at at Georgia and where he's at today. Uh, he no doubt grew as a player in Tuscaloosa. Yeah. Well, sounds like maybe he could be a sleeper for somebody, and I'll tell you what, if he's got that over-energized kind of intensity driving attitude, uh, the Chargers yeah. need a receiver, and Jim Harbaugh would be a great <laughs> coach for him. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yep. Ryan Fowler uh, from the Tide 100.9 FM in Tuscaloosa, I appreciate your time very much for joining us today and giving us the lowdown on Bama's prospects. Howard, did you want to add something? I want to ask one question. So how's it look? How Have you been around the spring at all? Have you seen, have you seen what these guys are doing? Like what's going on with the new coaching staff? Like, you know, saving steps away. Really just like, hey, that's it. I'm done. And like everybody's like, what? Now, now how's the new coach? How, how are they looking right now? All right, so we've had Kalen Bore on twice. He came on and, and did two interviews with us, one about three weeks ago and then one last week. 
Uh, the media access is much different than Coach Saban. We're getting access to all of the assistant coaches, all of the offense, all the defense. They're bringing those guys in, bringing players in. So from a media availability, uh, we hit the lottery down here because <laughs> Coach Saban was fun to cover, but he didn't give us access to any of the assistant coaches. So now we're getting that, which is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the system, there's a different vibe in that Malmore football complex. When you walk in, it's just a different energy. And I'm not saying – I hope people don't read into it that, you know, it was Coach Saban because it was not. It, it was just – he had trouble hiring coaches at the back end of his tenure. I mean, he, he really struggled because, you know, even Tommy Reeves and I, Howard, you, mm -hmm. you and I talked about this on my show. You know, think about Tommy Reeves. He leaves his alma mater, comes to Alabama. Alabama, Nick Saban retires, and now he's out of a job. Yeah. And so he has to leave. I mean, think about that. I mean, that was so it was hard for Nick Saban to bring these coaches away and not be able to look at them and say, hey, I'm going to be here for three years. I'm going to be here for three years. I'm going to be your, you know, at least three years. But, so but wasn't that a part of, to, well, sorry, wasn't that part of his success, though? When you're, when you're winning games and winning championships, don't teams want to cherry pick your coaches constantly? Yes, and, and they never stopped. But <laughs> it, it was, it, it almost became where there were so many coaches out there that, we're looking for the same type of assistant coach, too. Yeah. I mean, because I heard some names of some of these assistant coaches, and I'm like, really? I mean, is Alabama down to that level? Um, so when, when you look at hiring coaches, that was where it kind of struggled. I know the NIL played a role. I, I know we don't like it. He did it. Um, but it, it, th this new coaching staff is a, is a, fre it's a breath of fresh air. Um, when you go into the building, now listen, it'll all change if they start losing football games. We did not got there yet. <laughs> oh, that, that goes for in the pros it, too, right? That only, goes it, for us it, in it the only, pros. It, unfortunately, it, it, with the standard set, it only has to be two games lost. So yeah. as long as he beats Auburn, right. Tell they'll me be about all right. It. Ryan, we got to run because we, we got to get to our, our next guest, and I got to read a couple of spots. Okay. So thank you so much, Ryan Fowler. From uh, the Tide, 100.9 FM in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Again, thank you, thank you so much for your Roll time. We tide. appreciate you. Roll Tide. You guys have a great day. Take Amen. care. The, uh, the Tide always have a slew of top-notch guys. I mean, Howard, you know, it's so easy for you to, to, to walk well, around with, you, with, well, you, with your well, Tide-isms. Oh, I know, but you got, you got to remind me. You got to remember, there, there, were, there was a spell right after uh, – Coach Perkins left. I think it didn't happen again until Coach Stallings kind of came in. Then yeah. he left, and there was another a dry spell. Then when Coach Saban comes on, it just changes the 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 arc of the, of the program for a no while. No doubt, he, he had a dare I say a Bear Bryantish <laughs> kind of effect oh. on the team. Or now it's a Nick, run. now it's a Nick Sabanish uh, effect on the team. Like you, you don't get better than the best coach of all times. So that I got you. That works. All right, before we get to Mike Eisen, and then we will get to your phone calls at 201-939-4513. Remember, the Giants Huddle podcast has long-form interviews with all kinds of Giants folks, past and present, and national media folks. Uh, search for G the Giants Huddle. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Go to Giants.com slash podcasts. Also, Giants season memberships are available. Uh, season tickets can be yours all season long. You can stay connected to the team even if it's out of season. Memberships are now available for 2024. To learn all about exclusive member benefits, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available. And the Giants official connected TV streaming app is Giants TV. It brings original video content and game highlights on demand and direct to Big Blue fans. Giants TV is free on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire TV mm -hmm. and the Giants mobile app. In just a minute, we'll get to Mike Eisen, who is uh, representing Giants.com as the senior writer down at uh, the uh, Orlando NFL meetings. Uh, quickly, before we do, though, Howard, one of the, the big things that's come out of the meetings, and we'll ask Mike about it, but I want to get a quick take from you before we do. They're changing the kickoff rule for this year, and it's going to be more along the lines of the XFL rule where the players are going to be lined up, you know, only so, so many yards apart. They can't move or run or start going until the ball gets down. And there's a lot of little idiosyncrasies to the rule, but the league is saying they're trying to keep the kickoff in the game without losing it. Okay. So I appreciate the intent. Uh, let me let me just say this, and I understand the rules, and I understand, like, and I tell people this all the time, America's favorite food in theory is hot dogs. 
everybody loves an American hot dog. It's 4th of July, everybody has hot dogs. Okay. Nobody wants to see how they're made. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and you just don't want to see how they're made. And by letting all of what we, we thrive on access, we get paid to talk about football all year round, every, every day, every aspect of it. What's happened is that you got some of these commentators and some of these people like, oh my God, how can they do that? It's so dangerous. Not just the kickoff. So the other rule they're trying to imply is the, the no side tackle, where you tackle and fold around the guy. Oh, the, the hip, uh, the, the, hip the hip takedown, right? Yeah. But they've, they've now taken that out. I'm about to say, if that was still in and you had this kickoff, the games would never end because you just kick off the guy front down the field. You can't tackle him from the side. <laughs> Touchdown. And like it's just, it would just it just be like back and forth. There'd be no offense, no defense. It'd just be like, we gotta scheme up a good kickoff return. Mm -hmm. That's what it would be. I think the new kickoff return rules are good. I think that the old rules where people were lining up, if you if you did it where you couldn't throw your body at a guy, but just block him. Mm -hmm. Because it, the old rule was this. We'd get get together, grab hands, and we'd start running up the field. The guys coming down would be a wedge buster and a guy to pick off the edge. The wedge buster's only responsibility was to run down and try to run through and throw his body through those two guys. Mm -hmm. You stop them from throwing their body through, mm -hmm. and, you, and you don't let them grab hands, it's really a safe play. Okay. It just is. What they've done now is that they've let people say, well, we gotta keep the kickoff of the game, it's so dangerous. It's probably gonna be more dangerous because they're gonna be free runners. Because if you get up there and you get juked, it's, we watch it every week on punt return, mm -hmm. do we not? Mm -hmm. We watch it every week where we're like, oh, man, I wish they could hold up that gunner. I wish they could hold up that gunner. Maybe they should double that gunner. How are they going to stop? You get three or four gunners out there, they're not. They're going to be fair catching. They're not gonna, I'm not going to put my hand up and let the guy run free, free willy at me and hit me that hard. They're gonna, there's going to be some blow-ups. Okay. That's the truth. Okay. <laughs> Uh, that's Howard Cross's perspective. Now we go to Mike Eisen from <laughs> Giants.com, senior, senior writer who's in Orlando at the NFL meetings. And, Mike, I guess we should Every just start it off. Let's kick it off with the kickoff rule. Every week. Because we have now heard, Blops. We Blops. Have now heard Howard's opinion. Uh, from your perspective, uh, what's the scuttlebutt as, as people are now coming out of the meeting this morning telling us there's a new kickoff rule? Uh, well, I think the uh, most uh, often heard word about that is interesting. Uh, in <laughs> fact, I just, uh, I, I'm actually, uh, not, not to set the scene, uh, I'm actually down at the pool and I just ran into Joe Shane and he was saying uh, it's going to be very interesting, but he wishes they would have done it uh, prior to the start of free agency because it affects uh the type of player you're looking for under this new uh, rule. For instance, you, you, you know, you need two returners now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it just so happens with Isaiah McKenzie, they did add a, a returner, but he says, uh, you know, the type of people you want lined up uh, to cover kicks is, is might be a little different. So it, doing it this late in the process makes it a, a little more challenging. But I, I think everyone's pretty fascinated to see uh, how it all works out. You also made a good point uh, uh, that your picker is probably going to be more involved now in tackling. And, you know, you got to uh, – <laughs> yes, exactly. you got to be able to uh, make sure that your ticker can, ticker can tackle, uh, but obviously you expose him to injury. So, uh, you, know, you know, that may uh, – Cause teams maybe to, to add it, to carry another kicker just in case. Or so bring, bring a lot of, rugby there's guys. There's a lot of corollaries to this new rule that people really haven't thought of yet. Yeah, well, they should have consulted Matt Barr on the tackling kicker part. Well, I'll it, tell you that. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. it, like, I, like I said, you're going to need to find gunners and put them in that line. That if you put good gunners in front of those guys, if you get find four guys that could play gunner or five guys that could yeah. play gunner, you're going to eliminate the kickoff. Yeah. And, and the start. other thing is. If you have the uh, kickoff team and the kickoff return team, they're lined up five yards apart, the return team has a bit of an advantage because they can see where the ball's going and they could start earlier than the, the, the uh, kickoff team. Kickoff team has to react to what the return team does. Nah. So. The, the, the advantage will be, and I know what, the, what they're saying, the advantage is actually it's kind of like a slot receiver. and You're trying to cover him and stop him from going a direction. You can run at yeah. any angle you want. But we, I watch these guys every every week, every game, every every team, same thing. 
if you have a guy like a almost like a Renee Thompson, a, a legendary guy here that, that could cover that, that could cover kicks, even Jesse Armstead, who who covered kicks from the gunner position, you can't necessarily stop or angle a guy to stop them running down the field. If you have a guy that's running a a four four or a four three forty, you got to have a whole line of guys of four three forties to slow them down. Yeah, you, you got to be able to get a jam on them, and it's like every DB doesn't get a jam. Every DB doesn't play press coverage because some guys can't get jams. Yeah. So that's what they're and looking it, at. Yeah, it's going to be some free yeah. runners, a lot of free runners. Yeah. Well, you know, Mike, that, to go that, back to the return, the yeah. return part of it, Joe Shane mentioned that, uh, you know, Wandale Robinson is a guy who's not a punt returner. He doesn't really track the ball well, but he's he now becomes potentially a kickoff returner mm-hmm. in this new mm-hmm. scheme. And you so have to wonder when when teams are in that fifth, sixth, and seventh rounds, and we always talk about that being special teams area anyway, it may even become more important now mm-hmm. that you may see a guy in that sixth or seventh round and you say, well, wait a minute, he can handle this job maybe better than you would have had to, to think about it's, before. It's going to be a lot of guys. Yeah. There are going to be a lot of guys taken in the draft that were, you know, they, they may have been stars in their teams, but they played in special teams and they covered kicks because some schools do that. Like Alabama has put their starter, starters in there, and they're going to be like, oh, mm-hmm. we can use that guy. Even though he's not going to be a high draft pick, we can use him because he can cover. All right, Mike, right. yesterday mm-hmm. we, right. we know that Joe Shane talked. We know John Mara talked. Brian Dable talked this morning. I know you were there. Uh, are there are there some things that, that he said this morning that kind of either uh, opened your eyes a little bit or maybe were a little more interesting than others? I know you'll be you'll be writing stuff and putting it up on the site later on. Yeah, you know, Brian was, uh, as usual, uh, short on details and specifics. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, we're just looking forward to this. We're just looking forward to that. Uh, as, as far as interesting goes, you know, he's he is also, as John Maris said yesterday, he's open to potentially taking a quarterback at number six if that's the best player and that's what, you know, they decide. Um, you know, he certainly he talked about uh, – uh, a couple of the, the acquisitions, uh, Brian Burns and um, uh, Singletary and how excited he is to have them. He calls Singletary Motor, Devin Singletary Motor. That's, his, I guess, the nickname he gave him mm-hmm. in Buffalo. So he's uh, very excited to have uh, them, uh, understandably. Um he uh, didn't really want to get into, you know, understandably talking about Wink Market Martindale and, you know, the friction that they had, uh, just that he's very excited to. Yeah, he admits that uh, eight or nine new coaches is, is a lot in one year, but uh, uh, he, he really likes uh, Shane Bowen, the new defensive coordinator. He, he said that a few times. Um, he's not sure yet. How, what the uh, configuration of the offensive line is going to be. So we haven't even talked to the players yet. Uh, so, he again, he's, he's, he's kind of shying away from specifics about that. Um, he said uh, he did admit that sometimes he might have to tone down his sideline demeanor, that, you know, he said, I'm a passionate guy, and, you know, he gets kind of excitable. And John Maris said yesterday he'd, he'd like him to – you know, curtail maybe some of the uh, emotionalism, I guess, is the way you go. on the sideline. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and, Mike, yeah. maybe, maybe I missed it, but I, in go, culling through what Joe and, and, and Dave had said and also John, I, it seemed to me that they're non committal on a time frame to hear Darren Waller's decision about coming back or retiring. And to be frank with you, that surprised me a little. Now, maybe they have a time frame for him and they just don't want to say, but but I would have thought that they would like to know sooner rather than later if he's going to be in the plans. Yeah, I would think so, too, Paul. I agree with you on that. Uh, John, I don't think, was asked about it, uh, but uh, Joe just said, you know, those conversations are private. I've, I've talked to his agent. We're waiting, you know, to make it for him to make a decision. And then Dave's today was asked about it and basically said, I'm just going to, um, let uh, what Joe said yesterday uh, uh, stand, and Dave. So Dave essentially didn't even comment on it. But yeah, I mean the, the draft's a month away, and uh, um, you know Joe made the point of saying that uh, we have signed two tight ends this off season, but I don't think anybody is equating uh, either of them with what Darren Waller can do. No. So, yeah, it's a pretty big decision, and, and uh, they, they don't really seem to be in a, in a hurry to get it. 
I mean, you know, when a, when a guy's like, if this is what we used to always say, and this is nothing against Wall or anyone, but if you start talking about retiring, you're kind of retired. Yes, you're kind of retired. So, yeah, so that he, was Parcells' thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so either you're trying to convince him to stay and come back. So what part do you get? Or if, if this is a conversation that I could, you know, I'm thinking about retiring, then I make preparations for another direction. And then he'd have to come back and, like, you know, almost say, hey, look, I, I got to come back. This is my year. I want to, you know, give it all I got and everything. But it that's that's a hard play. And I hate to say it, yeah. but if, you, if you're talking about retiring, that means you're, you're retired. Yeah, you did. Like, you know, Aaron Donald just did it. He was like, yeah, I was thinking about yeah. it, and I, I did it. Now, Coach yeah. Saban did it. Coach Saban said he called a couple of people and they, they gave him the same advice. If you're thinking about retiring, you kind of retired. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, so Howard, uh, we may have an opening at tight end. You may want to start working out. Right. right. <laughs> I can't even walk through the walk. I can't even get on a plane without beeping. So, no, I, I think I'm good. <laughs> Hey, Mike, we're not we're, asking you to get on a plane. We're asking you to catch passes, okay? <laughs> That's right. We, we saw a note today. A Giants a PR staff said that uh, they've hired a new off, assistant offensive line coach, uh, James yes. Ferencz, who uh, had right. time with the Texans, Broncos, and Patriots in the NFL. Did anyone address from the, from the Giants as to what he will bring to the table? No, actually, because uh, the news came out uh, after uh, Dave's – Okay. Uh, news conference, so no one had really said anything about it. I don't think he's coached anywhere before. I think he's been a player. Yeah, and then he retired, and and so uh, that's that's kind of interesting. But certainly he's got some pedigree, two Super Bowl championships, uh, which is not oh, a yeah. bad thing to bring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you got coaching is different. You got to be you got to be ready to go. He's going to get a little education this time. I like it. Yeah. All right, Mike. Anything we should be looking for the rest of the afternoon before all your stuff gets posted on the site? Uh, not really. Uh, actually, I think one of them are, is up already. You know, I, I, I just on my way down, I looked out the window, and um, I, there must have been twenty big black SUVs lined up in the driveway. People are running the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think there's going to be any more news coming out of the owners meeting. Yeah, all right. All right. That's Mike Eisen, senior writer here for Giants.com down at the Orlando NFL meetings. Mike, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Uh, safe travels back. Thank you. Take care, guys. So, Howard, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh-oh, that's okay. one. Okay. No, no, we we know there's a little time off here for the players as they figure out what they want to do and mm-hmm. how they got to get their off-season stuff together. If if you were in Darren Waller's position mm-hmm. and and you take a few weeks after the season to take time off and then you start thinking about this stuff, if you were going to come back, hmm. When would you, in your own mind, feel comfortable making that decision, knowing the kind of off-season work regimen that you needed to prepare yourself? Different world. I, I was never Darren Waller. And, and okay. I, I don't mean it in a Darren Waller, like Howard Cross comparison. Just in my era, they were constantly trying to replace you. Like, it mm-hmm. was it was apparent constantly that in a no position from LT, Carl Banks, uh, Harry Carson, all of us, anybody you can think of, I'm not even in, in their in their same in the same swing speed as those guys, but they were constantly trying to re- replace you. So the moment the season ended, most guys started working out, started trying to get back in shape, trying to get back in that you know conditioning shape so they can get into the season. And then then you'd be like, oh, well, like in my last year, I had just had micro fracture surgery the year before. And Coach Fossil's like, you know, they were like trying to get me to have surgery again. I'm like, man, I'm not having surgery again. That that was ridiculous. Seven weeks, no pressure on your leg. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I, I can't do that again and play. And they called me up like, well, we may have to let you go. I'm like, appreciate the time. Turn off the treadmill. <laughs> I'm like, get, let's, let's do something else in life. So, okay. so my theory on it is like, if you're going to play, you know you're going to play. You're already working. You're already grinding. You're already doing all the stuff. And this again, my own personal opinion. You you know what you're going to do and what you're willing to commit to it. If you're thinking about it, this is not a dollar amount. This is not chasing a ring. But if you're thinking about what it takes to be involved with, and it's it's a it's, it was a lot harder back then. But but I would assume it's even harder now because back then at least we were training together constantly. Right. And and now. Sometimes they can't even get into the facility until the PA lets them into the yeah, facility and stuff. So it's, it's it's just a different world. So I I would be here with Sims and and guys training two weeks after the season was over. 
no, you know, coach would be coming in and man, you guys should go home. Like, we are home. And we just work out and watch tape and trying to get better to get something going. Now these guys are un- unfortunately not really locked out, so to speak, but not really advised well, to be around. Exactly. And, yeah, so. It's a different world. So it's in this, true. In this world, you have to make a commitment on your own. You, you make a commitment uh, with your family, uh, your wife if you have one, your your, your parents if, if they're involved in it, maybe your brothers and sisters or whoever, and you're trying to figure out, if, is this something I want to do? It, it's harder. It just, yeah. it, it's going to get, and it's it is not, and here's the thing, it's not going to get easier. And I, and I want to make sure, like Waller's doing it now, think about in five years from now, when all these kids that are getting that NIL money and they come in, they come into the league with millions and millions of dollars already, mm-hmm. they're going to have to make a decision. Is my next contract worth it? There's going to be a lot of turnover going forward when, it's, when these leagues come around. There's not going to be as much, you know, guys like, hey, look, this is my chance to make it big and I'm going to be okay. Some of these guys are going to make it big before they even get here. Well, let's say Waller doesn't come back. Bellinger becomes the lead tight end. Not a bad pick. Okay, which he's, he's a quality player. Mm-hmm. Not, a, not a superstar and not a huge receiving threat, but nonetheless a quality player. And then you got a lot of other guys who are now filling the gap guys. Think of it this way. You're thinking of it the wrong way. They're probably going to let's say they draft a top receiver. Some well, um, the tight end position becomes less important in the passing game. There you go. Sure. Let's say that they sure. let's say that they go. Hey, we're not sure what we're getting. Let's draft that kid out of Georgia. Because he's still going to be on the board at, at six. Bowers will be there. Sure. Yeah. Sure. But that's not like a reach. That's a that's a Darren Waller player. Are you allowed to like a Georgia player? No, nah, I don't like him. I just said that's <laughs> probably who they could draft. I don't like Georgia, Auburn, Tennessee. <laughs> I had him. I knew I, it. Like, I got him. I got him. I almost like wrestled Hyatt the first time I saw him. Uh, <laughs> all right, 201-939-4513. We've got 15 minutes left on the program. Chance for you guys to chime in. We go to line two. That's Andrew like- in North Carolina. You're first on Big Blue Kickoff Live today. Hello. Slayton, I tell you. <laughs> Hi. Hello. You guys there? We're yes, here. we are, Andrew. Thanks for calling today. I, I love you guys' show. I'm a huge fan. Oh, you guys thank you. Great That's very nice. Go Big Blue, baby. <laughs> I left work early to, to, to ask you guys some questions, so I appreciate you guys having me. All right. Well, fire away. So, I know you guys hear more than the average fan. You guys are around the building more. I'm not one to listen to media stories, but yesterday Mara kind of confirmed one with Dave's having to tone it down some, which is surprising because I love his outburst, mm-hmm. but it makes me a little uneasy with the rumors with Wink and Casper was looking for other options. So how hot would you say Dable's seat actually is this year? I don't know about hot seat, but let me, let me do this. The world has changed so much. That when yeah, I sir. when I played in in the football, and I hate to sound like the guy get off my lawn guy, but <laughs> that's what I sound like. Parcells <laughs> fired coaches on the sideline and trainers and cut players during the game every week. <laughs> this is like, like, constantly. You're like, oh, don't catch him before he falls. For God, it was just crazy. It. it was craziness it. all the time. Parcells couldn't coach today. They would not allow that. They would not allow the, the the way that he talked to us, and we've gotten you know in touch with our feelings now. So I I don't I don't really know how to explain and like and and it, and it becomes this thing where I remember a few years ago and, and I'm not saying that anything was wrong with this when Richie Incognito got in trouble for bullying another offensive lineman. Right. Two giant men who push people around were bullying each other. Yes. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like so. I'm not familiar with, with, with you know, coaching. If someone's yelling at you, it's usually because they love you. Coach Oriana over at, at, at Connecticut's women's basketball, I think the young lady came on and said she had a picture of him for his 70th birthday, and he was, like, screaming. She goes, this is the face I usually see. And now Hunter said, when he's going, I don't hear you suck. I hear you. I love you. And he goes, you need to get a better interpreter. But it was still funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I'm just used to something different. And if guys – Everything said is passion on the sideline. It's things said that you probably wouldn't say ordinarily. If you can't handle that, this may not be what you should be doing. It's how, no, I, sir. I, it's how I view it. But 
if that's what the head man said, then you know you got to think about it. Like I, I, I don't know. It, it's it's very hard to do the job, and, and I'm not saying it because it's the Giants. I'm just saying in general when you have to taper back so many things when you're demanding of your people of excellence. One thing to remember, caller, and, and, and that, that is and this, that's not, and that's not against Wink or anybody. No, either. I'm, I'm, I'm not, just saying I'm not in general. Saying it is. Yeah. One thing to remember. Brian Dable, for all the years he's had in football at all the different levels, mm-hmm. this is still his first head coaching job. And and he only just completed his second season doing it. Yeah, and the so first, he has he still has things to learn. It, it, first year coach of the year, next year you're too mean. Right. That's how I look at it. Yeah. Like and remember, we just got through talking to, to the reporter from Alabama and he just said, you know, it's hard for Alabama to hire coaches. Assistant coaches didn't necessarily want to deal with Nick. Yes. You, you didn't want to deal with winning a championship every other year. They didn't want to be. They didn't want to put themselves through. Like I don't want him talking to me. Look, like we that. know how Coach Coughlin <laughs> softened some of his edges, and it helped the Giants go on to win the Lombardi Trophy. So I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> everything. The point is, everything evolves, and everything is a process. Yeah. Okay. You know. I, I guess I'm just a little surprised because, like you said, Parcells. John Mira was around that. I'm I'm kind of just a little surprised that Mira actually it's, it's just a diff- spoke out about it. Yeah, it's just a different world, man. I mean, it's just a lot, like I said, I keep saying this over and over. Everybody loves hot dogs. Not everybody should see how they're made. They're just it's just not the <laughs> thing you want to know all the time. <laughs> all right, Andrew, what else do you have? And just following that, I believe it is there a little bit of pressure for him to really go and get his guy this year. You know, the outburst with Daniel Jones, you know, this has been his third year, the little bit of the rumors with the outburst. Does this add a little bit of pressure? I'm I'm completely with you. The receiver is there. Five five at, at, at slot number six. You get the receiver, maybe get quarterback later. But mm-hmm. I'm starting to really believe that Joe is pushing to move up, but he just can't. I, I think if they moved up, they have to give up a lot. And I even and, and it's only a couple of spots, right? Because from six to like three or something like that, two or three yes, spots. Sir. I think you give up a lot. And when when there are guys out there that people aren't talking about, like the like the quarterback from L, uh, from Florida State, right? That kid was on Travis. A, yeah, he was on a Heisman trajectory, and he got hurt. Yep, eleven and zero. Uh, still finished fifth in the Heisman, right? No one's really talking about him because he's coming off a knee injury. When these teams are looking for quarterbacks and how hard it's going to be and what's going on, look, that's a kid that, you know, hmm, interesting. That we, that no, well, I probably shouldn't be talking about it. But that's a kid that people yeah. should be looking at. That's a kid that people should be looking at. And, and, I, and I think, you know, with Daniel's contract being the way it is, and we're hoping that Daniel's 100% healthy when, it, when the season starts, uh, you know that he has at least one year uh, left in his contract. I think that that Dave Ball and those guys got more than one year left in their contracts. I think that you know they're they're they inherited a quarterback, right? They inherit they inherited a salary cap. They inherited a lot of things, and they did pretty good the first year. Last year, everybody would say not so much, but they lost the same amount of games by the one score that they won the year before. So they were just they were right there, just one play here and one play there. So it's going to be interesting to see how they get those get those one plays corrected and make those one plays two or three plays on the positive side. You know, Carla, also, Andrew, you, keep, you need to keep in mind there was something else that's been said by both Joe Shane. Uh, I also believe it's been said by Brian Dable as well. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of good prospects at quarterback in this draft. So could the Giants draft a pro- prospect quarterback? They could. It doesn't have to be in the first round or even the second round. Mm-hmm. It could be sometime in the third, fourth, or fifth. Mm-hmm. They think Spencer they, Rattler. They, they well, and I, actually, I'm glad you mentioned him because I think Spencer Rattler, while being a little bit smaller in terms of size, mm-hmm. that's probably the biggest knock on him. Spencer Rattler did very well at South Carolina, did very well uh, at the Combine. And Rattler, I think, is exactly the kind of prospect quarterback you're mm-hmm. talking about later in the draft. Yep. So there are a lot. There are a lot of different options. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Andrew, anything I else? You guys. No, sir. You guys answered my questions. Great. That was great insight. Uh, I, I will definitely be trying to call in sooner. You guys keep keep doing what you're doing. No, well, thank you that. for your thank time. You so appreciate much. it. Get back to work. <laughs> Don't let the boss know you made the call. 
201-939-4513 is our phone number here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. We've got about, what, seven minutes, eight minutes to go, so we'll squeeze in one or two more if you guys uh, want, want to squeeze it in. I think, you know, Howard, one of the things that I, I've been telling people, and it's very hard for those who are demanding, mm-hmm. pounding their fist on the table, got to draft a quarterback at six no matter what. No. And there's tunnel vision on that, which is just ridiculous. But here's the thing. You know, the Giants could very well draft a quarterback at some point in this draft and have that guy sit and groom, be groomed, and have Dable coach him up. Well, that that's you why— You don't have to draft somebody That's why I, I, I looked at the kid that was, like, kind of kind of going to be on— what we're, I guess he'd be on— um, not he wouldn't be on IR. We he would be on uh, what do you call it when you your freshman Injury year? Injury reserve, red shirt. He'd be a red shirt yeah. guy. He'd be a red shirt guy out of Florida State. The kid that's mm-hmm. a phenomenal talent. Uh, can run, can throw, can do all the things that everybody talks about. Very high rated passer, very mm-hmm. accurate. Uh, uh, not not the smallest guy on the planet either. So it, it makes him you know an attractive player later in the draft. And that's a guy that. You know, probably a lot of teams are looking at and trying to figure out how to get him into the to the fold. You know, you had Dobbs a few years at, uh, ago at Tennessee, got sure. hurt late, and then all of a sudden he comes in. You know, an aerospace engineer. And he, he, every time he goes to a team, he, he does well. There are certain teams that are going to be very intrigued by Joe Milton out of Tennessee, who is a big, strong, strapping quarterback mm-hmm. who has had very little starting experience with the Vols. So he's as green as celery. Yeah, he's okay? going to be way down, though. He's going to be like... He's, well, he's way, he's yeah, way he's down. Fifth-round draft pick, he's been, yeah. yeah, exactly. That's, that's exactly mm-hmm. what I'm thinking. Fifth round for him. Someone's going to take a flyer because they're going to love his size mm-hmm. and they're going to love his arm. He's got a cannon of an arm. Mm -hmm. Now, he's going to need a lot of polish, a lot of fine-tuning, and a lot of development. Mm -hmm. But he's got some pure physical tools that somebody's going to say, in the third day, I'm going to take this guy. Yeah, And and I don't need him to play for a year or two. That's okay. He's He's a developmental quarterback. He's going to be fun to watch in preseason. That's and and yes, man, he, can he throw? He can throw it. What and, a cannon and, he's got! And he's fast, and he's big. He's, yeah, you know, that, sure that, is. That's the new prototype guy. Everybody's, everybody is uh, Cam Newton or what was the kid that went to the to, to the Colts at that time? Richardson. And, Andrew Luck. Oh, okay. <laughs> everybody's Cam Newton or Andrew Luck. Everybody's like massive human beings that can slam the ball down the field and run over you if they had to. <laughs> well, you know, you know, it's funny, Howard, and and you can relate. You can relate a little bit. Uh, mm-hmm. I've had some fans ask about, you know, well, you know, the Giants never took a developmental quarterback. And I said, what about Jeff Hostetler? <laughs> They've had a ton of development. You know, I know, but, but there's a guy. Are... There's a developmental guy. What about Danny, Danny Cannell? What about Kent Graham? Exactly. <laughs> My point was, though, that Haas not only was a developmental quarterback, but went through all that he went through, including play special teams and wide receiver, mm-hmm. and then wound up winning the Super Bowl. I would even dare say Dave, Dave, Dave Brown was a developmental because Sims was still here. So you know, you, now, you, yeah, now guys. not all those other guys you mentioned necessarily had the success. Obviously, the, the, the Haas had the team, won a, but the teams weren't the teams weren't as good. They weren't as good. No, but they, they weren't as but good. the guys came in and won some games. I so caught anyway, passes from all of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so anyway, there's nothing wrong. And if you believe, by the way, and here's my point about this too, about potentially taking a developmental mm-hmm. and why it's logical. If you believe that strongly in Brian Dable's ability and his track record of helping to develop quarterbacks, well, that even makes more sense because now you're putting some trust in Dave's to be able to groom a guy over the course of the next year or two. Me, personally, I do here and now. I take care of the here and now and the whole development thing, I get it. But if there's a well, play- that's why I'm taking a receiver at yeah, six, okay? Has, has, I do here and now. <laughs> I, I need receivers. I need a, I need a big Wally, Molly Whopper in the middle somewhere to try to help me out. Uh, I might need another big lineman somewhere down the line. You know, I, I need some guys. I need some guys. I need, yeah, I, I sure I, do. I possibly need a cornerback, you know, potential safety. Like, you, you – See, and this is why you don't trade up, Howard, because the expense to trade up is going to cost you too many if, picks if we and get, you can't fill these if, holes. If you get lucky, somebody will fall to you that everybody wants and you can trade down and get like four more picks. There and, you go. And you just, but you just need some guys. You, they're still rebuilding, repaying, repaving the way. And then these guys that are – I don't mean any harm to anybody – that are healthy, that, that, that came in healthy – and they're, this, you know, they're going to play healthy for the year. You don't need guys that are banged up all the time. And that's hard to do. Your best ability is your availability. And not having guys that are healthy, and I love all our guys, but that's a that's a problem. Need more healthy bodies that, that can play. Now I can see you week in and week out. 
We go to line one. We're going to get this caller in real quick. A couple mm-hmm. of minutes for Randy in California. You're on the program. Hello. Going back to Cali. Hey, guys. How you doing today? Okay. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. I love you guys' program. I watch you guys. Uh, Thank you. Every day. I can't wait for the content. It's oh, great. Awesome. Um, I had a question. You know, they had the owners meeting. The, it seems like the bye weeks are getting later and later. Why do they keep doing that? Why can't they have them all done by a certain time? Or do you like the all-star, like the have all the bye weeks in one week and have the uh, the uh, the Pro Bowl, right, in the middle of it, right, and then everybody continue on? Why can't they do it like that? Uh, I have no idea. I'm just curious. I mean, <laughs> we can't do the that. Pro Bowl in the middle of the season because nobody would go. No. You're not going to risk well, injury. Goes anyway. or... Nobody goes anyway. Well, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, right? Well, now it's a skills competition right. anyway, but so, so I, they're not going to interrupt right. the season. I, they're I, not going to do that. I think the TV contracts are so big, they, they want to make sure TV, that you know when football is being played during the season, NFL football specifically, it is the number one rated show every week. Uh, the, one of those games somewhere is, is if it's not a Monday night game or a Thursday night game, it's a late afternoon games that, that are number one rated in, in some markets, sometime nationally. And they're not giving that up. They're, they're, that's just right. that's too many billions of dollars. And they're not giving that up. The, the, the thing about the uh, I think the, the week that they get off, you know, the bye week, I think the bye weeks are because now there's 17 games. So you're trying to squeeze yeah. you're trying to squeeze all these games in before you have a potential nightmare at the end of the season and and I and I and I don't know you know if you get 12 games in or, or 10 games in and then all of a sudden you it's another snowstorm that 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 tears up one of the indoor facilities or you can't get into a or a stadium or something then you can move things around because right. you got most of your games played and most of the games are quote unquote uh, non conference games so like. If it comes down to very late in the season and there's a huge snowstorm here at, at Giants, uh, the Giants MetLife Stadium, they might go down to Carolina and play in their stadium while, while Carolina's playing in, in Tampa. Not that that's happening, but I'm just saying in general, they're trying to make contingencies because the, the season got longer. And not only did the season get longer, the Super Bowl's played later. So there's more chance right. of, hey. of weather inter, intervening in, into the season. Randy, I would expect within right. the next two mm. or three years you're going to see the regular season go to 18 games, the preseason go to two, mm. and mm. you may even right. have – I know, Howard, I know you're a player, so I understand. <laughs> and you may even wind up seeing an extra bye week. I mean, that's what the USFL did. They did 18-game regular seasons with two bye weeks for each team. Mm. I would not be surprised if that's the way the NFL if goes. If they do that, they're going to start playing in August. Yeah, and, and, and I caught you on – yeah, and I caught you on a huddle yesterday. You and Banks were talking about the uh, hitting the quarterbacks and, and all the other kind of things, right, and the penalties. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, I, I'm sorry, but at some point, because you're paying these quarterbacks way too much money, $40, 50000000 million a year, why don't you just put flags on them and call it a day? No. Because it's, it, it's, almost getting, it's almost getting to the point where it's not flag football, uh, tackle football anymore, like in the 70s and 80s, what we grew up on. Well, right, I I, under, I, understand, I understand they don't yeah. want to get in trouble for the for the for the league to get in trouble, like you know, for concussions and everything else. I get that, right? Safety, but at some point, it's still football. So yes, anyway, it, I appreciate it, you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and to follow up on this comment, there, yes, it is still football, but just like we said, why are the why are the games done the way they're done? We said you can't do that because they're not going to give up any money. Trying to keep your quarterback on the field because there's sometimes, most of the time, they're the marquee player. You want to see the marquee matchups. You want to see the Mahomes versus Allens. You want to see whoever versus whoever. And, and when that guy isn't in, like look at look, look at Cincinnati last year. Look at us last year. We we had a bunch of different guys playing quarterback. You want to see the marquee guys, and they just do. And and that's that's part of it. More eyes are on the TV when. You know, more women know who the who, who the starting quarterback is, except for this year. <laughs> except for this year, they know who Kelsey is because of Taylor Swift. But outside of mm-hmm. that, usually you know who the starting quarterback is on the team. Uh, that is true. <laughs> All right, that'll do it for this edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live. Again, we are here every weekday live from 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time till 1.30 in the afternoon here at Giants.com. Don't forget you can catch an archive of this show and all of your favorite Giants podcasts on your favorite podcast platform or Giants.com slash podcasts. Uh, as always, the show is presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Giants. For Howard Cross, I'm Paul Tatino. We'll see you next time.